Hey everybody, Pastor Matt here. Thank you so much for checking into our podcast at Gospel Fellowship PCA. Hey, what if I told you that there is a solid, biblical, doctrinally faithful, reformed church on a beautiful campus just a stone's throw north of Pittsburgh? Would you be interested? Well, let me tell you a little bit about it. We don't have lasers. We don't have a fog machine. We don't have an American Idol stage, but we do have the sweetest, kindest people in the whole world. We sing psalms and hymns, and we preach the Bible chapter by chapter. We love Jesus, and we're on a mission to share the good news of the gospel with the world. So would you be interested in coming to a church like that? If so, come check us out, Gospel Fellowship PCA in Valencia, Pennsylvania. And feel free to visit our website, gospelfellowshippca.org, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gospel Fellowship PCA. Presbyterian Church. And now for today's message. Amen. All right, let's turn our Bibles now to Daniel chapter 7. We're going to finish up Daniel 7 this morning. A bit of a longer reading here, but that's okay. It's a rich and very profound one. So let's go ahead and stand up together for the reading of the Word of God as we acknowledge that God's Word is inspired. It's the inerrant and infallible word of the true and living God. Again, Daniel 7 is the text. We're going to begin in verse 15 and finish up the end of the chapter. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all of this. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Verse 19, Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured in broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell, the horn that had great eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High." And shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him." Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, All John ever wanted was a simple life, peaceful life. He wanted to study, he wanted to read great books, he wanted to write some great books of his own. Uh, If he traveled a little bit of Europe and saw the mountains of France and the Alps of Switzerland, all the better. And yet it was history that drew John in to a profound moment in time. It was almost as though fate itself compelled him to come in. It was almost as though God himself thrust John into this huge war that was taking place. In fact, it was an actual war that turned John Calvin from his path to the city of Jerusalem, where, of course, he did his great work as as one of the uh, well-known reformers and theologians. I say war, uh, not so much thinking of the physical, material, military type of battle, but rather the spiritual war that was taking place in the times of the Reformation. 
And Calvin was drawn into this, and by God's hand, he was placed in this poignant moment of history in which God's Spirit was poured out in one of the greatest revivals that we've seen in history, except for perhaps the times of the Bible itself. So here's this trope that we see sometimes in literature and in the movies of this man who wants peace, right? He wants peace, he wants security, he wants the rest, he wants leisure, perhaps some recreation. And what happens? Well, history often grabs a hold of these sorts of people and throws them into a particular moment in time in which more is demanded of them, more is required of them than that leisure that they initially sought out. And we think, for instance, of movies. We see this in the movies all the time. Braveheart is built on such a construct. So too the movie The Patriot. So too the movie of Gla like Gladiator. Like All of those movies have this in common. It's a man who wants a simple, normal, a leisurely, perhaps family life, maybe a little bit of peace and security. And what happens? They're thrust into these moments, these epochal moments in history in which more is demanded of them. And we might think of Daniel, too, as being such a man. Remember our context here. Daniel is one of the exiles who was dragged out of the promised land, and he's brought to Babylon, where essentially he's taken as a captive. He's given some good treatment from time to time. But Daniel is the, the faithful prophet in the midst of a pagan society and culture. And here, in our text today, what's happening? Well, Daniel has just seen three visions, right? We've looked at each one of these three visions in the past few weeks. We saw, first of all, that vision of the four beasts, which is going to come back for some explanation here this morning. We saw his vision as he looked up and he saw the Ancient of Days, God the Father, seated on the throne. And we looked last week as he saw the Father, the Ancient of Days, give over the authority to his Son, who is called the Son of Man here in last week's text. And now, what happens in today's passage, it's a little bit complicated, but we're going to try to, to make of it what we can, is that Daniel asks for help. He calls out for help, and what he's seeking here is some interpretation to bring context, to bring clarity, to bring understanding, to bring illumination to what he's seen in these three previous visions. And so, Daniel here in this text, verse, what is it, 15, he calls out, he's anxious, he's alarmed, and so he calls to one of those, verse 16, who was apparently standing near. Now, who are those who are standing near in verse 16? Who is Daniel talking to? Well, I take this probably to be a reference back to chapter 7, verse 10, where Daniel sees a thousand thousands and 10,000 times 10,000, probably angels is what's happening here. Angels or saints, maybe both. And so what Daniel does is he calls out for help to interpret the things that he's seen in these three visions. And this angel or this figure, we're not really told who this is, comes alongside Daniel and provides our text, which is an interpretation of the visions that Daniel has just seen. Does that make sense? Everybody tracking with that, what we're looking at here? So, uh, this is a complicated vision, and honestly, like, look, the rest of Daniel, this book, is hard. Every week is harder than the last now. From this point on, the narrative stories have come and gone. Uh, we've seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, Daniel in the lion's den. Everything we're going to do from this point on is hard in the book of Daniel. And so today, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to make this make sense to us by giving us four principles that are threats to us as believers. And then we're going to turn the corner and talk about four comforts that we see from this passage as well. Okay, so no applications at the end. The points are the applications today. And we've got two sets of four coming up. Four threats that are real threats for you and I as believers. Things that we will encounter as Daniel encountered them as well. Maybe not in the same ways, but certainly we will and then four comforts that I think are going to establish our hearts together in the gospel this morning. So let's start off with the bad news first, and then we'll get to the good news a little bit later on. So four thoughts of bad news here, four threats. First, I want you to notice that deeper understanding of these visions does not take away Daniel's anxiety. Okay, And we might expect that to take place. We might think that once he gets an explanation for what he's seen, that actually his stress and his anxiety would dissipate, that it would go down. But that's not what happens. In fact, if you look at the beginning and the end of the sections that we just read, Daniel is confronted with what we might call extreme anxiety and alarm 
both before he hears the interpretation and after. So look at verse 15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and visions of my head alarmed me. So he's in a state of anxiety, of spiritual angst as he's seen these visions. And so what does he do? He calls out for help. Somebody explain to me what I've just seen here. And then, yes, an angel or an attendant gives him a rather thorough explanation for what Daniel's seen. But look what happens. By the time we get to the end of the chapter, the end of chapter 7, verse 28, he is no more um, comforted, I would say, in verse 28 than he was at the beginning. Because here he says, Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. So at least he's able to to some extent, restrain his anxiety here. But the fact that he has better understanding of what he's seen does not necessarily bring him comfort. Uh, You may have probably seen the movie, I trust you have. It's been out for decades now, The Matrix. Do you remember The Matrix in this quintessential scene where Neo has to choose between the red pill and the blue pill? You remember this little show of hands if you know what I'm talking about? Okay, some of you do. And the, the red pill, if he takes the red pill, then he understands the reality of the world that he's in. And it's a complicated world as it turns out. And he has to then confront the evil that is manifest in his certain situation. If he takes the blue pill, then what? He goes back to his normal, boring desk life of a job in which he goes on in sort of mundane day-to-day existence. And so what does he do? Well, similar to the man who wants security but is thrust into this moment, Neo chooses the red pill, and so all of a sudden, what happens? He becomes aware of the reality that is around him. And Christians, listen to me. Um, For those of us who we have our Bibles, and we have the help of the Spirit to understand these things, even when we begin to understand the Scripture at deeper levels, and we begin to understand the realities of the spiritual warfare that is truly and really around us, that isn't necessarily comforting, right? Because what do we learn? Well, we learn if we're faithful to Scripture, that we're in the midst of a spiritual war. What is our memory verse for the month? Ephesians 6.12, right? We, we wrestle not against the powers of the flesh, but the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. As it turns out, we are living in such a moment, such a time, such a context, in which there is great evil surrounding us. And the fact that you're aware of that, some of you, I hope you're aware of that, that doesn't necessarily come across as a balm to your soul or a salve to your conscience. In fact, the more that you're aware that we're living in a spiritual war with angels and demons and satanic manifestations and troubles and all kinds of the proliferation of wickedness, that's not a comfort to us. It actually increases anxiety. And the more you realize these things, sometimes the more anxious you become. If you think about the fact that every single person that you know has an eternal soul, right? That is someday going to live forever in either heaven or conversely in hell, right? That sort of raises the stakes of the game, doesn't it? And it's not an easy comforting thought necessarily that eternity is on the line, but that's the truth of the matter. It's the truth of the reality as we find it. And so uh, if you take the red pill, so to speak, what you begin to realize is that, yes, um, this life that we are thrust into the middle of, it is not about weekend trips and golf outings and new bottles of wine and fall clothes and all of these things that we could, we could, right? We could do it. We could take the blue pill and ignore the spiritual realities. But instead, What Daniel sees here is not necessarily, first of all, a comfort to him. Now, we'll get to some comforts later. But secondly, here's the second threat. The second threat in this text is that the powers of darkness are real, not imaginary. They're real. Like, Look at verse 17. What does verse 17 say? This is part of the interpretation. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of of the earth. And so when this angelic interpretation comes, notice what the angel does not say. He does not say, Oh, Daniel, you've had a bad dream. Uh, you're waking up now. It's okay. Everything's going to be all right. The angel does not say, Daniel, you were just dreaming. These are figments of your imagination. He doesn't say that at all. Instead, what he does is he confirms the things that Daniel has seen in this vision. 
and he interprets them, but the interpretation is no more serene than the vision. So what does he say? These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. Now, I wish, don't you? That some of the things that we see when we look out and we look at our society today, we look at the world around us, I wish I could chalk it up to like mistakes or coincidences or bad decisions. I wish I was naive in my worldview in which I said to myself, you know, if we just elect the right people and if those people that we elect just make the right decisions, then they can fix, they can sort of recalibrate, they can sort of like modify the society in which we live and things will be turned to right again. But I don't believe that. That's too naive. Because that sort of a simplistic worldview does not make sense of the reality of the evils that are in our day. And in every day, as a matter of fact. I wish, wouldn't it be nice if the most diabolically wicked people were just inept and incompetent? Wouldn't that be nice? Because then they'd be really, they'd be really malevolent, but at, but at, least, but at least they'd be dumb. But, it's, but it's, that's not the case. Um, unfortunately, the reality is this, that sometimes the most evil people in the whole world are actually the most competent and the most malevolent at actually churning up even more evil. And so that is certainly what the angel is trying to describe here. The beasts that you saw, what are the beasts? How does he interpret them? They're people. They're wicked people. Malevolent, evil, very powerful people. And yes, We've been interpreting this entire vision correctly throughout our series in Daniel. The four beasts obviously are the four kingdoms of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Each one of these kingdoms is going to come under the microscope to a greater or lesser extent as we work through this book here. But please uh, don't miss the point here that even as these beasts are actually tyrannical, diabolical kings, yet even these kingdoms are going to sprout other horns that aren't necessarily easy to interpret. And so if you ask me what the horns stand for, Maybe there are other kingdoms. Maybe there are other kings that are come, going to come forth. Maybe there are even the sort of powerful machinations that evil, twisted, diabolical governments can churn up. I don't know what they are, but I will tell you this. Thirdly, and this is our third thought here in terms of threats, that evil is often stronger than we feared it was, unfortunately. Why do I say that? Well, Again, if you look carefully at the interpretation to the vision, it actually goes further than the vision does in the first place. Look at verse 19 in your Bible. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. Now, okay, so... Much of that sentence that I just read is drawn from when Daniel saw it in the vision earlier in chapter 7, right? Especially verses 7, well, verse 7 of chapter 7. But notice here that in the angelic interpretation, something is added to the fourth beast. Did you catch it? it? Took me a minute to catch it myself, but it's there. He's already been described as being exceedingly terrifying with teeth of iron, but now in the interpretation, we're also told that he contains claws of bronze, which undoubtedly are symbolic, sure. But teeth of iron and claws of bronze? Okay, all right. Well, I was already pretty worked up just about the teeth of iron, but now I've also got to worry about claws of bronze. Well, what is he saying here? Well, sometimes the manifestations of evil are actually worse than we might imagine them. And that's probably true in reality as well. Evil is sometimes more powerful than you even imagined it would be in the first place. Now, I want you to think back, if you can, to something I taught a while back. I don't remember when. It's been a, it's been a minute. Do you remember when we talked about the different kinds of evil that there are in this world? Do you remember this? I'll just rehearse it real quick. Three kinds of evil, at least, probably more, but let's start with these three. First, there is what we might call simple evil. Simple evil is when a man does something foolish and he wrecks his life, okay? So a guy gets his paycheck, he takes it, he gambles it away. Now what? Now he can't pay the mortgage, okay? So he messed up his own life. Simple evil, simple mistake, tragic consequences, sure, 
But that's a pretty basic form of evil, okay? But unfortunately, it gets worse than that. There is also natural evil. Now, we don't think about natural evil very often, but it is undoubtedly in the world all around us. Natural evil is the kind of evil that's just in the water, so to speak. Natural evil is a response to the fall going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Natural evil manifests in things like viruses and tick-borne Lyme disease and floods and tidal waves and tornadoes and hurricanes. It's the kind of evil that is simply churned up by the fact that this creation has fallen in the garden. And if your life isn't threatened by simple evil, the simple evil that you bring into your own life by your mistakes, often it's threatened by natural evil that just comes to you often when you're not expecting it. Cancer is a natural evil, right? But then third, and this is the third category of evil, there is something that we might call complex evil, which are evil systems of diabolical machinations that are much bigger and larger than simple evil could ever be, right? That's the kind of evil that's being described here in Daniel chapter 7. It's complex evil. Who can stop these beasts? Who can close their teeth of iron? Who can dull their claws of of bronze? Certainly not I, not you either. Complex evil is much bigger and greater than we could have ever possibly imagined. In fact, I might even use this word, cosmic evil seems to describe it. Because cosmic evil suggests that it's an evil of a merger between satanic power and human malevolence. When those two things combine, you have complex cosmic evil. That's what Paul says we're fighting here in our memory verse, Ephesians 6.12. Okay? It'd be nice if it was just simple evil, but it's complex cosmic evil that rises up against us. Fourth, and we'll stop here as far as the threats go, but notice here that you and I, we are thrust into the midst of a spiritual war. Look again at verses 21 and 25 in particular here. Two verses that I want to call your attention to. First, verse 21. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. Daniel 7, 21. Pause right there. Many of the theologians have interpreted the little horn as an antichrist figure, and I would largely agree with that, okay? I'm not going to get more specific about the antichrist or the man of lawlessness today. We have talked about that in the past. I'm just throwing that out there for your consideration that many of the theologians think of this horn as an antichrist type figure. But notice what he does. This horn made war with the saints. And, check this out, he prevailed over them. Okay, so that's scary. And then we have verse 25. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Three things here. First, it is the evil one who brings the war to you. Okay? He made war with the saints. He is the aggressor. He is the hostile one here. It's like when you're in middle school and a fight came to you and you didn't want to fight. You didn't want it, but it came to you in the cafeteria or the hallway or by the flagpole after school and you're terrified because you didn't want this. You didn't ask for this. And there you are. Okay? And not only does this fight come to us aggressively by the evil one, but I wish this weren't in the text, but here it is. He prevailed over them. This antichrist-like power does oftentimes in this life prevail. He wins. We'll come back to that. Hold on to that thought, but it's there. And then third, in verse 25, he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Now, just quick illustration. If you've ever wrestled before or boxed or did judo or jujitsu or any one of the martial arts, you know this. This is true. Your greatest fear going into the match is not what your opponent's going to do to you. Your greatest fear is exhaustion. It's always the scariest thing. When you get so exhausted that you can't defend yourself anymore, that's the scariest thing. And here, what does it tell us? That the evil forces will wear out the saints. So what am I telling you here in the first part of the sermon? I'm telling you that your life is not going to be leisurely and easy. Uh, We wanted that, 
But that's not what we get. In fact, what we get is something more like Christian in the book Pilgrim's Progress, who every stage of the journey turns out looking something like a fight, right? He's got to fight his way out of the city of destruction, or at least argue his way out of it. He's ha- he, has to, he has to drag himself out of the slew of despond. He's got to actually fight Apollyon in the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, he has to make his way through Vanity Fair. He's got to survive Doubting Castle. It seems like if you read the book, part of John Bunyan's point is that every aspect of your life is not going to be easy or leisurely, but rather it is a spiritual conflict. That's the nature of taking the red pill of Daniel chapter 7. You're aware of the realities that are around us in this life. And I don't need to tell you that because many of you are already aware of how difficult life is. It's hard. Okay, so let's turn our attention then, praise be to God, to four comforts that are also in this text. And we save the comforts for later because they're greater than the threats. So here they are. First, number one, victory is ours. <laughs> like, that's good news, right? Victory is ours. Look at verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and shall possess the kingdom forever forever and ever. Now in the Hebrew language, you can't say it any stronger than that. Okay, He like doubles and triples up on this language. Possess the kingdom forever and forever and forever. Now notice here in the victory portions of Daniel chapter 7, it's very clear how it is that this victory is obtained by the saints. Do you notice? Look again at verse 18. The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. Okay, So this is a kingdom that comes to us by grace. This is a kingdom that you actually don't go out and you have to defeat your enemy in mortal combat one-on-one, but rather this victory is given to us by our God and specifically through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not only do we receive it by grace, but we hold on to it by grace. We possess the kingdom forever and forever and ever. Now somebody says, well, wait a second, Everhard, you just told me a minute ago What did you do? Did you lie to me? Are you a hypocrite? Do you contradict yourself? You just told me that sometimes the evil one wins in this life, right? Yes, yes, he does. However, as we all recognize, there is a great difference between a battle and a war, right? You can lose plenty of battles, and at the end of the day, that doesn't matter if you're victorious in the war. Um, If you're in a boxing match, again, another martial arts illustration, you can lose up to five rounds in a 12-round fight, but if you win the fight, it's better than losing a round, okay? The same thing is true, spiritually speaking here. Notice the emphasis on receiving, receiving the kingdom, Daniel 7, 18. Also, judgment was given, Daniel 7, 21, given to the people, Daniel 7, 27 here. So the whole emphasis on this text is, is victory of the people of God by grace. That's the thrust of this passage. Secondly, good news here. Justice will be rendered where? Where? In eternity. Look at verse 26. Okay, justice. Boy, what a word these days, right? Justice will be rendered how? In eternity. Verse 26. But the court shall sit in judgments, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. So even as all of these evil machinations are occurring in real time, yet there is a court that is sitting in judgment over all these things. And the one court that really matters is the court over which God himself presides, the eternal court. Now, I I would hope that you and I um, that for the most part, we would never have to face a human court. Okay? I, hope, I hope you never have a lawsuit. I've never been in one myself. I hope you haven't either. Um, because they're some of the most terrifying and, whew, boy, being in a lawsuit will just rip you apart in so many ways. Human courts, for the most part, intend to be just. Whether or not they can actually carry that out is a completely different question. Human courts often lack information. 
Human courts often lack perspective. Human courts often lack full context. Human courts often do not have all of the witnesses that are necessary to actually bring a right judgment. And even if those things were true, very often the judge or the jury themselves are tainted by bias, even though they swear that they're not. Okay? You don't want to fall into the hands of a human court, and I don't either, because they're so terribly fallible. Even the best. And frankly, not a lot of them are the best. But there's other kinds of courts, right? There's the court of human opinion. There's the court of the media. There is the court of renderings of various verdicts and opinions of professional societies and guilds. We have unelected officials making judicious determinations. We have unions. We have professional associations. All of these things, they render judgments. They make verdicts. They gather opinions. They provide consensus. Some of them are more or less persuasive, perhaps, but none of them matter. At the end of the day, like this court here described in verse 26, and praise be to God, it is because of his mercies and his grace and his clemency to us that we will finally be vindicated on that day. Perhaps not in this life, that day. Next, third comfort. Notice the repetition of the language of saints in the plural. Okay. Not saint singular, but saints in the plural. It's all over this text. Did you see it? Look at it. Let's just count them up. We got a reference in 717, 721, 722 mentions it twice, uh, 25, 27. Why is it that Daniel 7 emphasizes the plurality of the saints? Why do you think? Why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. Jump off. Number one, because Daniel's experience has been so terribly isolated throughout the book. Right? I mean, we've made mention of this the last couple of weeks, how almost everything that Daniel has to go through, he has to endure it alone. Dreadful. Not like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who at least have each other. Daniel has to constantly go through these things alone, and it's here in this vision that Daniel's eyes are opened up and he sees the spiritual reality. He sees the Ancient of Days and he sees 710 what? The thousands and the tens of thousands that stood before him. And so Daniel realizes, no, I'm actually not alone here at all. Not at all. I'm not alone. I feel like I'm alone. It feels terrible. I'm not alone. In fact, there's all of these other ones who are with me glorifying God and rejoicing in him and worshiping alongside of me. And look what happens here in this passage. The moment that Daniel calls out for somebody to come stand next to him and help him is the moment that he already receives that help and somebody comes and stands with him. Okay? This is why the saints in the plural are stressed so clearly in Daniel 7 because you and I, we need each other, right? Right? My goodness, this life is so hard. Could you imagine doing it alone? I can't. I could never imagine it. You know, apparently there's this thing out there where Christians um, try to live without the church. I would never do that. Uh, there are some people who would describe themselves as born-again Christians. Uh, they call themselves evangelicals, whatever that word even means anymore. Who knows? It has a definition, but we don't use it very accurately. There are people out there that try to live the Christian life alone. My goodness, I cannot imagine something more foolish than that. We need each other. I could never do this without you. Some days I think you couldn't do it without me. We need each other. And Daniel 7 promises us that there is a victory that comes by way of the unity that we have in the fellowship of the body of Christ. If it wasn't this church, it better be another one, but you have to be with the people of God. Okay? And then finally, fourth. Notice, of course, the major theme in this text that Daniel and all of these tens of thousands are servants of the Most High. Servants of the Most High. Look at verse 27. The kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole earth shall be given to who? To the people of the saints of the Most High. You may know this Hebrew word here. The Hebrew name for God given here, the Most High, is Elyon. Have you ever heard that before? It's in the Bible quite a bit. Elyon is the divine name here. 
45 or so times it appears in the Old Testament, half of which are in the Psalms. But Daniel, interestingly enough, he uses the Hebrew name Elian more per capita. Now, it's a shorter book, obviously. Daniel is shorter than the Psalms. The Psalms use it more, but Daniel uses it the most frequently of any of the Old Testament writers. The, the Hebrew name for God, Elian. Why is that? Why do you think? Why is it that Daniel very often refers to God as the God most high or the most high God. Why do you think so? Here's my thought. Because Daniel is living in the midst of a pagan society, right? And in this pagan society, there's all sorts of claims of deities, probably demons behind them though, yes? And Daniel, the one thought that continues to come into his mind, that is a solace and a foundation to him, is that the God that he serves is God Most High, Elion. God is the God who is greater than Satan. He is the one who is greater than the demons. He is the one who is greater even than the angels. He is greater than the principalities. He is greater than the powers. He is greater than the unclean spirits. Do this with me. Take out your bulletin one more time and let's look at our, our memory verse of the month one more time here. Ephesians 6, 12. Notice this. I'm trying to memorize this together as a church. Ephesians 6, 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. If all you had was that verse, that might be a little bit terrifying, right? Because what Ephesians 6.12 tells us is that you have enemies in the form of present darkness, uh, authorities, cosmic powers, rulers, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, and yet your solace in all of this is that your God, Christians, is Elion, God Most High. And so as it turns out, the Christian life is not a life of ease and pleasure and leisure, but rather it is very much entailed with spiritual conflict. However, it is a life of joy and love and victory and peace and ultimate salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? At the end of the day, that is a more meaningful life, isn't it? The meaningful life the most meaningful life is he who is aware of the spiritual realities that is around him and seeks to strive against them by the power and the help of God Most High. Amen. Let's Hi, everybody. My name is Rob, and I am a deacon at Gospel Fellowship PCA. I'm also the sound engineer, the camera guy, and the podcast manager. Thank you so much for listening to today's message. Please come visit us in person. Gospel Fellowship is a Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh, and you can find us at gospelfellowshippca.org. See you next time.